I just like to welcome you all today. I'm Mariam Hamadani, the Associate Director of CCSRE, and we are so glad to see you here for today's event. Now, before I turn it over to Al Camarillo, who's going to introduce our speaker for today, I'd just like to call your attention to two events coming up in our Research Institute's regular series. And they're also on the flyers that are on your table, so please make sure to take one on the way out. The first is on April 30th, as part of our Faculty Fellows Chautauquas, or Book Salon series. We are going to have uh, Lauren Davenport, Assistant Professor of Political Science, talk about her new book manuscript, Beyond Black and White, Multiracial Attitudes in Contemporary U.S. Politics. And that event is going to take place in the CCSRE Building 360 Conference Room from 4 to 6 p.m. And please make sure to RSVP so you get an advance copy of Lauren's manuscript. Then, on May 14th, as part of our lunchtime seminar series, please join us again back here, same time, same place, to hear David Fitzgerald, Associate Professor of Sociology and Co-Director of the Center for Comparative Immigration Studies at UC San Diego, talk about his new book, Culling the Masses, The Democratic Origins of Racist Immigration Policies in the Americas. So please come back and hear our, uh, our final series, um, excuse me, Rick Street Seminar of Spring Quarter. Can you believe we're here already? Oh my goodness. <laughs> and then finally, keep your eyes out for the announcement for our 10th annual Kiva Distinguished Speaker Lecture, which is coming up on May 29th. This year's speaker will be Nancy Cantor, Chancellor of Rutgers University, Newark. She's a renowned leader in higher education and also a Stanford PhD alum in psychology. Her talk is titled, The Looking Glass University listening to strangers, and tending to democracy. So keep an eye out. Hope to see you there May 29th, 4 p.m., Paul Brest Hall in the Munger Conference Center. So now let me turn it over to Al Camarillo, Professor of History, Leon Sloss, Jr., Memorial Professor, and, of course, Founding Director of CCSRE, and he'll introduce our speaker, Tomas Jimenez, for today. Hello, everybody, and welcome. A wonderful turnout. Thank you for, for uh, showing up. I know you're going to be rewarded with a wonderful talk. It's an extra special pleasure for me to introduce Tomas Jimenez. Uh, and as I get into an introduction of this brilliant young scholar, uh, you'll understand why it's so special for me. And I may embarrass you a little bit, but, you know. <laughs> So it's 20 years ago that I had the uh, pleasure of launching a project that was funded by the James Irvine Foundation. And the James Irvine Foundation had supported what we call the diversity initiative uh, at Stanford for about eight or 10 years and substantial uh, amount of, of funding to create a variety of programs, some of which actually were the basis for the founding of CCSRE. So this was 20 years ago, and I was the director of a program called the Irvine Fellows uh, Future PhDs. So this was a pipeline program. Uh, and as you may or may not know, Irvine Foundation uh, has to direct its funding to private universities rather than public universities. That's part of its, of its uh, uh, charter. So it was Stanford, we were the, the lead institution, and a variety of public, uh, private institutions, small colleges across the, the, uh, the state, one of which was the University of Santa Clara. And we brought these young, really bright uh, participants, they were nominated from their respective colleges and universities, and we brought them here, and we gave them a heavy dose of what it's like to be in graduate school, right? Um, but all the good stuff, not the bad stuff. But to, to, <laughs> but to get them prepared, get them thinking about PhD programs in the humanities and social sciences. Tomas Jimenez was a 19-year-old from the University of Santa Clara. And I remember vividly, I, I, I knew who he was because I knew his father, who was a faculty member at University of Santa Clara, a distinguished literary scholar and one of the founders of, of Chicano literature. Um, but I gave him no special place in, in, in our cohort, but it, it became very clear to me and Laura Selznick, who was involved in administering this program, this guy is really smart. 
and he's really motivated and he's engaging the curriculum as if he were already a graduate student. So then he went off his merry way to finish in 1998 at the University of Santa Clara. Then I hear from him a couple years later. He's been admitted to Harvard uh, Department of Sociology and he gives me a call. And I hadn't talked to him in a couple years, but we knew following the Irvine Fellows, we knew where they were going, right? So I knew that he was at Harvard and he calls me up and he says, Al, I'm, I'm beginning to generate some ideas for the dissertation. And, and I really want to do something on the Mexican-American middle class. And I, I know you remember. I said, Tomas, come on, man. Don't focus on the middle class. The thing right now that we really need to know about is the impact of contemporary immigration on existing communities. That's where the action is. I didn't hear from him again. I figured he just uh, completely. <laughs> I didn't hear from him for years. So I figured you know, he, he didn't take my, any of my advice. And then I hear, uh, not a couple years after that, he's been appointed to the faculty right out of graduate school at the University of California, San Diego. So I knew he had done well. And that's when um, you know, I started to look and see what publications were coming from, from Tomas. Next step, a couple of years later, the Faculty Development Initiative uh, through the Center for Comparative Studies in Race and Ethnicity is launched in 2008. In 2007, the, the provost, some of you may or may not know, in 2007, uh, the provost made an unprecedented um, decision to approve a proposal that those of us involved in the center had made to uh, provide faculty appointments in collaboration with the center and departments and schools across the university. So in 2007-08, we launched the first two searches. And one of the departments is sociology and we define the search as immigration and the second generation. Let's comb the land. Let's go across higher education landscape. Let's find the very best candidates at the, at the assistant professor level. And Matt Sniff, who is not here today, I think he's in a faculty meeting in sociology, um, was our liaison to that committee. And I remember when Matt, Matt reported back to the CCSRE faculty leadership about the candidate of choice, said, we have this wonderful candidate. Tomas Jimenez from, from um, San Diego, UC San Diego, and we think he has the potential to be a star. And lo and behold, he is appointed at Stanford. So one of our very first appointments um, in the Faculty Development Initiative, and of course, that, that warmed my heart to know that a young fellow that I knew as a 19-year-old, he actually did take my advice because <laughs> the book that he published, a wonderful book, um, uh, it, it, let me give you the full title, uh, Replenished Ethnicity, Mexican-Americans, Immigration, and Identity, published by University of California Press in 2010. Uh, it, it's a fascinating study of what happens when you have successive waves of immigrants, this from Mexico, that begin to not only connect with but impact existing populations of Mexican-Americans. So what happens when you have cycles of immigration that replenish, yes, uh, but also complicate identity and other things. And Tomas's book was a, one of the first books that really grapples with the dynamics in these existing, existing communities that are the receiving end of new waves of immigrants from Mexico. In fact, this book is so good, it won the um, Distinguished Book Award of the American Sociological Association uh, in, this, in the, so, the sociology of Latino section, so outstanding book. Um, we hired Tomas as, as an assistant professor, and we say, go to work. <laughs> do the work that you have to do to um, ensure that you will have stability here at Stanford. And he went to work. And if you look at the list of publications, it is incredibly per, uh, uh, impressive. Um, the mainstream journals, American Sociological Review, the American Journal of Sociology, International Migration Review, Ethnic Studies Journals, Ethnic and Studies, Ethnic and Racial Studies, Social Science Quarterly, uh, the Du Bois Review, the Annual Review of Sociology. He's prolific. So we brought him as an assistant professor, and last year he was promoted to associate professor with tenure. Now, yes, that deserves. 
I kid him now because I said, as assistant professor, Tomas, you know, we're going to lay off you. We're going to support you, provide you with the resources, curricular relief. But man, once you hit associate professor, we are going to exploit you. <laughs> he is now the director of Chicano Chicana <laughs> Studies. So we put him into a leadership position, well, appropriately so, because I think I think the, the evidence is there. This is a, a young scholar who his career will just take off at Stanford. There's every indication of that. Um, Tomas' uh, is, scholarship has been recognized not only with book awards, but with fellowships. Uh, he was a fellow, a SAGE fellow at the Center for Advanced Study in the Behavioral Science, uh, Sciences up on the Hill. He was an Irvine fellow, again, another Irvine fellow, at the New America Foundation. Um, and interestingly, at such a young age, he's already emerged as an important public intellectual on the issue of assimilation, of the impact of immigration, immigration policy. He, he writes, for example, uh, Los Angeles Times op-ed pieces, CNN.com, the Chronicle of Higher Education, San Diego Union Tribune, uh, and other newspapers. So he's taken his basis of knowledge as a as one of the leading young scholars in the nation on the issue of immigration, but he's connecting it to the real world out there, very important. So we'll see more of Tomas, both as public intellectual and as productive scholar. Uh, he has lots, he has amazing amount of intellectual energy, and I won't speak to uh, the uh, many projects that he's engaged in, but we're gonna hear about one that I think is particularly fascinating. Uh, again, I remember our conversations that led to um, the formation of the project you're going to hear about today. So it's the continuing discussion about the impact of immigration. But in this book project, um, he's flipped the discourse. It's not about how, um, how the dominant society is affecting immigrant populations and their offspring as they become assimilated, integrating into society. He's flipping the question, how do successive ways of immigrants, different types of immigrants, change the core of the existing whole society? And that is a really important question because that's happening. And I won't describe it to you because you're gonna hear it from this young man, so please join me in uh, welcoming Tomas Jimenez, Associate Professor. I, I've had the great fortune of being introduced by Al a few times, and, and every time he gets done, I wonder who this guy is to the, that he's talking about. Uh, I'd really like to meet him. Um, doesn't sound anything like me. Um, thank you so much for, for having me here for the generous introduction. Thanks to, uh, for, to Rick Sri for hosting uh, this event and inviting me to share with you um, some of my work. Before I get into that, I just want to say a, a, a quick word about uh, Al. Uh, and, and going back 20 years, I was, I was seven years old. Uh, I, was, I was a genius. I came very early here. I was seven years old. No, uh, it was 20 years ago, and I came to this program, and, and Al invited several of us, in fact, the whole cohort over his house for dinner. And I remember hanging out at Al's house and thinking, you know, this guy is so cool. He's a professor at Stanford. He's really hip. He's got this really fun, good-looking family. I want to be like that someday. Uh, and, and I've had a chance to work with Al in a few different capacities uh, here and, and uh, sought out his advice in, in what to write about for my dissertation even before that, and, and that hasn't changed. I still want to be like Al Camarillo, so that's, that's, uh, that's a lot to shoot for. Um, what I want to do today is share with you um, a book manuscript that is in progress. Uh, in fact, I'm writing the, the conclusion for the book manuscript. Jose David joked with me earlier that maybe I was starting with the conclusion, and so I had only gotten a few pages. No, I'm actually writing the conclusion to the book and, and wrapping it up. Uh, and it's a book that's tentatively titled Strangers All Around Immigration and the Transformation of the Individual American. And as Al mentioned, uh, the book, in essence, is not about uh, immigrants or their children, which has been the overwhelming focus of um, sociological scholarship on immigration for the better part of the last 20 years, it's about the established populations. And, and the um, motivation for the book comes from an observation that I, as an immigration, uh, student of immigration and assimilation, and many others have made 
about what's going on in American society over the last three decades or so. And that observation is that immigration is dramatically changing American society. Of roughly 13% of the population was born in another country. About a quarter of the population was born in another country or have parents who were born in another country. As this little picture on the top right shows, 22 of the 100 largest metropolitan areas in the United States are majority minority. Um, immigration is changing. Uh, how we listen to music, what we eat, the languages we hear, how we think about politics, how we think about what it means to be American, the ethnic and racial composition of the United States, just to name a few. And yet we as immigration scholars mostly think about immigration in general through the lens of assimilation and how the immigrants and their children are assimilating into an American society that we often say they are dramatically changing. For the last 100 years or so, there have been two broad accounts about how that's happening. One is a, what some people call a straight line assimilation account developed mostly to explain the experiences of the Southern and Eastern European immigrant groups that came here at the turn of the last century. And that account says that over the course of generations, immigrants and their descendants uh, eventually become absorbed by a mainstream without changing it very much, but become absorbed by a mainstream uh, as evidenced by uh, their um, stated ethnic and racial identities, uh, linguistic abilities, intermarriage, residential integration, and the like. Well, when this new wave of immigrants, what we call the post-1965 immigrants, started coming, mostly from Latin America and, and Asia, but also from the Caribbean, sociologists uh, started to rethink assimilation and uh, for, for a generation, uh, for the next generation of immigration. And they developed this idea of a segmented form of assimilation. And they observed that today's immigrants come from a diverse uh, set of regions and come from a diverse set of class backgrounds. And they also observed that American society, much like the immigrants who come here, are divided by race and class, divided into race and class segments. And so what they said is that assimilation is a segmented process where immigrants of today uh, assimilate into one of many segments of American society divided by race and class. Now, as much as those scholars would like to think that their account of assimilation is really different from that straight line European account, it is still fundamentally a story of group absorption. It's fundamentally a story about how a, so a whole society and its many segments absorb immigrants. There's really no account at all about how those segments might be changed as a result of this absorption. Richard Alba and Victor Nee have written a little bit about that, but they write about it with a kind of hundred years of hindsight. And they say that as immigrants, immigrants assimilate into a mainstream, they change the mainstream itself. But it's really more about what immigrants and their descendants bring with them into the mainstream as opposed to how the people who are already navigating the mainstream purportedly um, navigate it. And so I want to uh, flip the assimilation equation here. Uh, in this book. And instead of asking how immigrants and their children mainly are assimilating into an American society that they're changing, I want to take that change as given and ask how the established populations that have been here for many generations are adjusting to contexts that are in many ways heavily defined by immigration. And so the driving question is how do the hosts, and I should say here that I define the hosts as people who were born in the United States of US born parents. That almost by definition excludes anyone whose families immigrated after 1965, although Juan Pedrosa is here and we're writing about the new third generation, but they're very young. Um, but this is fundamentally about the established populations. And I ask how do they experience and make sense of this immigration driven change? And the motivation, or the, I should say the inspiration for that question, comes in part from the observations that I've already mentioned, but also in part from a rather old and, in fact, perhaps the first formal definition of assimilation uh, that was offered by social scientists, by Robert Park and Ernest Burgess back in 1921 as part of their um, sweeping textbook and kind of classic textbook on sociology. Now, this is a mixed audience in many respects, uh, but particularly in terms of our disciplinary uh, background, and in some uh, departments, uh, I realize that mentioning the term assimilation can make people's ears bleed. So let's take a look at, and in, in sociology, it, it, it is not a four-letter word. Um, 
Let's just take a look at this definition really quick. Park and Burgess say assimilation is a process of interpretation and fusion in which persons and groups acquire the memory, sentiments, and attitudes of other persons and groups and by sharing their experiences and history are incorporated with them in a common cultural life. There's a couple of observations I want you, uh, well, I want to make and, and hopefully you buy them about this definition. The first is that Park and Burgess are agnostic about who assimilates to whom. This is a process of fusion. There's no sense or there's no uh, description here about one group being absorbed by another. So that's an important distinction to make. So in spite of our kind of old notions about the racist ways that people thought about assimilation, if you really read Robert Park, he was, uh, he was actually quite progressive. Um, and the other thing I want you to notice, which is, which is equally relevant to the study that, that I undertook here, is that it's a process of interpretation. It is a social psychological process that involves how people make sense of their new setting. They were really thinking about immigrants. Here I'm thinking about new settings that are defined by immigration and defined by immigrants. So I think of assimilation as a relational process, a relational process that, and the kind of crudest of terms, involves a set of immigrant guests, really immigrants and their children, who are adjusting to new national, class, and ethno-racial contexts, but more to the point for my book here, also a group of hosts, people who are U.S. born of U.S. born parents, who are adjusting to contexts defined by mass immigration. And there's diversity within that host population, much as uh, some of the um, scholarship in the last two decades have mentioned. It's not just a white middle class population. The established population is, in fact, quite diverse, and I try to capture that. So the book captures a few, and I should say the study more generally, captures a few different dimensions of this relational process of assimilation. One is ethno-racial identity, perceptions of and experiences with ethno-racial boundaries. I'm going to talk a lot about those two things today. In fact, I'm almost exclusively about those two things. But also everyday practices. You know, are people really eating more salsa than ketchup? I don't know if you caught that little picture I had with it. I love that picture. Um, <laughs> the ethno-racial composition of people's social networks, and then conceptions of American national identity vis-a-vis -vis immigration, the idea that uh, the nation is not just defined by big events and loud people, but uh, in everyday life as well. So how did I study this third plus generation? I did lots of interviews. Interviews are a really appropriate way to get an understanding of how people interpret their experiences, and, and that's fundamentally what these interviews were about. I interviewed along with Adam Horowitz and Manica Brooks. Adam, you raise your hand over there. Adam did about, oh, I don't know, roughly half of the interviews probably for this project. Maybe not quite half. Um, uh, with people who are U.S. born of U.S. born um, parents living in Silicon Valley. Um, and I went to three different areas in Silicon Valley, each of which corresponds to that segmented nature of the host society that some immigration scholars mention. Fortunately, I'm in a room where I don't have to say too much about these locations because most of you know something about them having lived around here, at least for a little bit of time. But the first place is East Palo Alto, which, as many of you know, is um, a relatively poor place that used to be defined heavily by an African-American population. In fact, I'll mention this a little bit more later, was the black population or the black community in the Silicon Valley. And um, that population has been now replaced in numerical terms by a Latino population, mostly Mexican immigrant population. But this represents what some scholars would call the rainbow underclass. I actually think that's an inaccurate term, not just for East Palo Alto, but more generally. But that's the term I'm using, barring a term from Alejandro Portes, who's speaking in our department on June 4th, if you want to take this up with him. Um, but really represents the kind of poor black and brown segment of the American society that, that they talk about. But we know that uh, immigration today is not just defined by the poor, the tired, the huddled masses. It's also defined by the PhDs, the lab engineers, the tech engineers. And we know that better than anyone uh, living here in Silicon Valley. So I was interested in a community where immigration was defined by the high skilled. And so we went to Cupertino, which was, is a very high SES area. We'll talk a lot about Cupertino today. Mostly a white established population, also a later generation Chinese and Japanese American population. So the hosts include Chinese and Japanese Americans. Uh, but the immigrant population there heavily defined by South and East Asian, heavily defined by South and East Asian high skilled immigrants who are uh, in many cases quite wealthy. So here in Cupertino, we interviewed 
uh, mostly white individuals, but also some later generation Japanese and Chinese Americans. And East Palo Alto, with the help of Manica Brooks, who's now at the uh, University of North Texas, she's graduated at ed school here. Um, we interviewed almost uh, all but one of the eight respondents was African American. We interviewed roughly six pe 60 people in each of these areas. And then the third area is Berryessa. How many people know anything about Berryessa? This is a place where some people don't know much about it. Okay, Berryessa is a neighborhood on the east side of San Jose. Uh, it is um, solidly middle class. It's an area where in the 1970s, when it was kind of emerging as a residential community, there were large homes that were pretty affordable. And so the um, a, a mostly white middle class, but also an emerging Mexican-American middle class, Filipino-American middle class, some African-American middle class individuals started to move there because you could buy a big home and it was relatively affordable and you didn't have to commute that far. Um, today, Berryessa is heavily defined by Vietnamese immigrants, uh, but also by a um, population of Mexican immigrants who have kind of a foothold here. These are people who might kind of own small businesses. Uh, and also some um, South Asian populations. So this is the kind of mixed in the middle uh, segment that I would describe. So each of these correspond to uh, those various segments that have been defined in the literature. And I wanna give you a sense, I really need to give you a sense, when I give this, a, a talk like this and in other places, I try to tell people you know, where these places are to give them a sense of where I'm talking about. Um, I'll, I'll go ahead with that exercise here, even though most of you know. East Palo Alto, Cupertino, Berryessa here, it's a neighborhood, a politically defined neighborhood on the east side of San Jose. This is a map of the geographic Silicon Valley divided up into census tracts in 1970. Uh, and as the census tract gets darker, you can see by the legend up here, uh, it becomes more heavily defined by immigrants. This is what it looks like in 1980. This is what these places look like in 1990, 2000, and then the most recent period for which we have data. Santa Clara County is, in per capita terms, a larger immigrant gateway than Los Angeles County, a larger immigrant gateway than New York City, than Chicago, second only to Miami-Dade County. About 38% of the population here is foreign-born, about 56% of the population is either immigrant or the children of immigrants, and it's a very diverse immigrant population. So in many ways, for someone like me who is interested in how people make sense of immigration-driven change, for someone who is interested in the process by which that relational uh, process of assimilation might unfold, this is the perfect way to study it. So what I have here is an account of how that happens when it happens. I have some speculation about uh, the factors that might contribute to the degree to which assimilation is relational, but this is an account of how it happens when it happens. Uh, there's no better place to go than, than a place where that kind of process is in full bloom. Just to give you a better sense of how these places differ uh, demographically, I, I have a uh, table here that shows the characteristics of these places, uh, along with Silicon Valley and the United States more generally in, to, in 2010, which is actually when we did most of the interviews. Uh, I'm trying to publish this quickly so that I'm publishing sociology and not archaeology. Um, <laughs> Ruben Rambao uh, often makes that joke. Um, uh, so you have East Palo Alto, Cupertino, and Berryessa. And I'll let you kind of peruse these categories as quickly as you can, or these, I should say, these cells as quickly as you can. But I want to point out very quickly, these are places with a very large proportion foreign-born. They are also places that differ dramatically by class, and I know I've said this, but, but you can just see by uh, the median household income, even by Silicon Valley's heady standards, $120,000 median household income is high. Uh, and the, these are also places, if you just kind of take class and, and occupation as measures of, um, sorry, if you take education and occupation as measures of class status, you can see that the proportion who have a bachelor's degree or more differs dramatically in East Palo Alto, Cupertino, where it's almost three quarters of the population that has a bachelor's degree or more, and Berryessa. And much the same story emerges if you look at the proportion working in managerial or professional positions. Again, Cupertino, almost three quarters of the population uh, in, in the working age is uh, in managerial or professional positions. But I want to focus the question down a little bit. This is the kind of upshot of the entire book and the motivation and, and the background, but let me tell you a, a little bit about a particular chapter that, uh, that I've written about in the book. And that chapter really answers the question, how do the host's experience make sense of immigration driven change, including their own ethno-racial identity in these contexts? So this is really about ethno-racial identity. And I'm going to focus in particular on blacks and whites here. Blacks and whites in all three of these areas and the way in which immigration is shaping the status and content 
of uh, their ethno-racial identity in ways that it matters in those contexts. So in Cupertino and Berryessa, I'm going to talk a lot about education. In uh, um, East Palo Alto, I'm going to talk a lot about kind of material and symbolic representation, and then kind of weave these stories together to, to make a larger point. So let's first visit Cupertino. I mentioned a second ago that Cupertino is a high-skilled immigrant gateway. It's a place where uh, whites were 95% of the population in 1970, or close to 90% in 1980, and today make up about 29% of the population. And when Adam and I were doing interviews in Cupertino, we got together and started talking about some of our initial findings, and we noticed that in particular response to a question that we asked of every respondent that we interviewed in this entire study, which is in Cupertino's case, how would you describe Cupertino to someone who's never lived here before? Inevitably, individuals talked about ethno-racial identity and education. And in Cupertino, the upshot is that the meaning and status of whiteness in relation to education has been flipped on its head. Now, Traditionally, both in kind of the academic literature and, and what one might describe as, uh, as everyday life, uh, whiteness stands as a privileged category, a privilege that comes partly from its, um, its invisibility, a, a need to not state whiteness as the dominant category, because as the dominant category, uh, it, it overshadows all others as a cultural norm, as an achievement norm. If you look at uh, social science studies that, that try to gauge the success and failures of different groups, whites always stand as the kind of benchmark category. But that, cate that benchmarking also registers in everyday life, where acting white in some contexts can stand for high academic achievement. People like Prudence Carter and others have kind of debunked the significance of that or how wide-ranging it is, but, but very few would dispute that it does exist, although perhaps not to the degree that some would imply. But nonetheless, Acting white in Cupertino has come to mean something dramatically different. It's come to mean something dramatically different precisely because there is a new standard, an ethno-racially coded standard, that is defined heavily by East and South Asian immigrants and their children. And so whiteness here is highly visible, and it's visible with respect to educational achievement in a way that makes being white rather uncomfortable from the way that it would be experienced in other kinds of settings. I'll uh, let you hear from Angelica Mills, who is a 17-year-old high school student, and she's white with some Asian ancestry, although by her own reckoning, she's a quarter Japanese American, by her own reckoning, most people think that she's white. She summarized the situation in Cupertino, uh, and a situation uh, that we heard over and over again characterized uh, like this. If you're really studious and you're white, you're called Asian at heart. Just like they're the white people who act Asian, they're the Asians who act white. They're the Asians who party. It's definitely a smaller percentage. There's not a big of a population, but you can find it. What we were surprised about was how pervasive this notion of whiteness is. The notion that whites are, in fact, the dumb ones in schools. The ones more likely to slack off, dabble in drugs, drink, party on the weekends, and participate in sports. Not only that, those activities didn't particularly garner one status at these high schools. Status was much more based on high academic ability, on participation in future business leaders of America, debate, uh, high SAT scores, the kinds of things that we're used to here at Stanford, when you know this concentration of type A personalities. Um, and we heard it over and over, not just from uh, the kind of everyday individuals we interviewed in Cupertino, but also from teachers who, in some cases, in spite of their best efforts, um, endorsed this particular ethno-racial coding of achievement. Uh, when we first, when Adam and I first started to see that um, the kind of everyday individuals in Cupertino were talking about uh, the encoding of achievement in this way, we went and started talking to teachers. And some of the teachers reported their own uh, accounts of what they had heard from their students. In some cases, they would say that students would talk about their schedule for the next semester, and one student, in a particular case, asked another, are you taking any AP courses? And the student replied, no, I'm going to be white this semester. Or some students would ask you, a student might ask another student, are you going to do, uh, do homework this weekend? And a student replied, no, I'm going to act white this weekend, which meant that you're not going to do homework. Now. That particular notion of uh, ethno-raciality and achievement uh, is more complicated than might be implied by these crude categories. It also signifies a connection to an immigrant background. So when pressed, uh, 
individuals would specify that they were really talking about the Asian immigrant crowd. And in fact, there was a whitewashed Asian crowd, the later generation Asian American crowd. And being whitewashed was defined in part by one's kind of deployment of uh, the symbols and practices that would signify their ethno-racial background, whether they're Japanese or Chinese American, but also by their approach to school explicitly. Let me read you a quote from a teacher that I think captures, and we hide this teacher's identity as much as we can. And it's a long quote, but it's worth reading. He said, oh, it's just a reversal of roles. I mean, the whites usually kind of get to sit at the top of the heap for whatever reason, whether they mean to or desire to or meant to. And it's just kind of interesting to see. You look at someone who's white, and you kind of assume that they're probably not the best student. And then, and he's imagining to himself out loud here, okay, a group of students have just walked in, and as a teacher, I try not to stereotype, of course. But after a while, I guess I just assume, even I'm beginning to assume right now that when the kids walk into the classroom, the white kids probably aren't going to be my very, very best students. They may do great work, but they won't turn it in on time or something. If I were to go back and look at the grades I've given, I'm sure that the GPA for the white kids I've had would be lower than the GPA for the Asians I've had. I'm sure of it. So if whiteness is becoming more visible and the meaning and status is being flipped on its head, somewhat ironically, blackness, oh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. Let me talk about <laughs> Berryessa first. Um, somewhat ironic, I have it right in front of me here. But, um, so if, if, uh, if whiteness is getting flipped on its head uh, quite explicitly and overtly in Cupertino, Berryessa represents a case that in some ways uh, draws what's happening in Cupertino into further relief, but in other ways kind of complicates the picture. So this is a middle class area heavily dominated in, in the immigrant side of the equation by Vietnamese immigrants who were highly successful. But when it comes to achievement, whiteness is almost entirely irrelevant in Berryessa. It doesn't serve as a category of a reference point uh, almost at all. There is a population, a large population of Latinos, and a large by Silicon Valley standards, population of African American students in the schools here who buffer the fall of whiteness to the bottom of an, of an ethno-racially coded achievement hierarchy. Now, one key thing that I should point out here and should have pointed out a second ago about Cupertino is that Cupertino is defined almost exclusively in white and Asian terms, and people lump together South and East Asian uh, populations under the umbrella term Asian when they talk about achievement. Berryessa offers something of a contrast showing what happens when you introduce other groups into the mix. And yet, when people talked about ethno-racial identity achievement, academic achievement loomed large. But the accounts that people gave were one where blacks and Latinos buffer the fall of whites to the bottom, and whites don't necessarily sit on top either. So this is a, a quote from uh, a young woman I interviewed who is um, half Mexican and half white, although her stepfather is Portuguese and she is heavily engaged in the Portuguese American community. It is one of these kind of uh, interesting only in America cases. Um, but she, she had a lot to say about the achievement hierarchy in, in the particular uh, school that she went to. And she said, black people are always the dumb ones, Mexicans are the slackers, white people were up there, sometimes more ahead, of than Asian, more ahead than Asian people, but usually not. There was always, yeah, Asian people were the smart ones. Asians are more like, oh, get good grades, go to college. That's their mindset. Mexican people, just the ones I've been around, like have fun, but try to stay in school. White people, yeah, get good grades, but still have fun at the same time. But Asian people, it's always been like their goal. At my graduation, the valedictorians, all but one were Asian. So it's a situation where, um, where whites don't quite rise to the top, but, uh, um, but, um, but they are certainly not at the bottom. But there are micro contexts, even in uh, Berryessa, where some of the same dynamics that we observed uh, unfolding in Cupertino play out. So if you get into some of the advanced track classrooms, uh, which we did after we started observing um, people talking about ethno-racial identity and achievement, you hear some of the same things. So this is a quote from a teacher whose um, son went through the honors track at one of the high schools in Berryessa. And uh, the teacher says the following. I'll say my son's own experience. He said, papers get passed back, and the teacher says, one person got a perfect score. On a regular basis, it would be my son, both in writing, he's pretty extraordinary, and math. He says, mom, no one ever asks me, ask if it's me. They'll turn around and go, was it you? Was it you? I'll bet it was this one. I'll bet it was that one. He says, no one ever says, was it you, Michael? No one. 
And it took him, by the time he was a junior, when teachers started saying, Michael's actually got the high score, whatever. But he said that the Asian students didn't want him to be in their groups because he would say, my students would tell me the same thing. Asian parents teach their kids, don't, you're not going to study with the white kids. They don't have their work, they don't have that work ethic. They're not going to work hard. They're going to bring you down. We heard similar things in Barry S. It plays out in kind of microcosms here in, um, I'm sorry, we heard the same thing in East Palo Alto. It plays out in more of a microcosm in Berryessa. So if whiteness is gaining visibility in many ways from the kind of invisible uh, um, privileged position that we normally associate it with, blackness in East Palo Alto also ironically is becoming more invisible, where we often associate uh, blackness with a highly visible um, category, precisely because of the large settlement of Latino immigrants. And in, in East Palo Alto, this invisibility in many ways reifies the meaning and status of blackness, one that um, is associated with larger notions in American society. The African-American respondents we interviewed in East Palo Alto talk about how blackness has become materially invisible, but also symbolically invisible. It becomes materially invisible because East Palo Alto, as a relatively poor community, was once a place where the major service agencies and even the schools, to the extent that they had a focus on a particular group, focused on helping African Americans. And African Americans, particularly the very poorest African Americans we interviewed, said that um, the focus has now switched to Latinos, in part because Latinos have taken some leadership positions in some of the service agencies and now um, uh, help their own, as many put it. So as one individual uh, I interviewed put it, um, we'll call her, I should mention these are all pseudonyms that, that are sort of sociological equivalents of, of their names, and I've even changed their occupations in some ways. She said, I think the equal top opportunity shifts where they may feel the need to help their own versus being equal and keeping things right, morally right and fair, by helping the next person who's in line. So if you're Michelle Johnson, I'm just making up, I'm just making a name, who's next in line at the house for the housing certificate, and you had a Hispanic, and you see Sylvia Fernandez, do you really have something in you? Do you really have something in you to do what's right and not put Michelle Johnson's application up under Sylvia Fernandez? That's the type of thing that might cross my mind or concern me, because I've seen it happen. It's, dis it's distributed according to the percentage uh, of the surrounding county. That's a concern I have. Who's getting all the help? who's getting everything. So there is a sense that there is a kind of tussle for resources and Latinos are winning out, but there's also uh, a symbolic invisibility that respondents mention. And the history of East Palo Alto is important to understanding the symbolic invisibility. It is, as I mentioned a minute ago, uh, has historically been the black community in Silicon Valley, which overall has had a pretty small uh, black population. And here I'm talking about kind of the, the South Bay and the peninsula, not so much the East Bay. It was a place where, in spite of uh, a history of crime and a history of drug violence, people still took pride in the community and especially a sense that uh, there was a black um, heritage to be celebrated and one could celebrate it in East Palo Alto. But people feel like that's going away as Latinos have moved in and now the observed celebrations have much more to do with, um, with Latino populations. And so, uh, a, Aaron Mullen, who uh, drives a UPS truck, a UPS truck driver, um, and I should mention Aaron's wife is a second-generation Mexican-American woman with a daughter uh, who is mixed, and they are teaching her Spanish, had this to say. The last June fest Juneteenth festival we had, I don't know how they can call that a festival. It wasn't even a festival. It seemed like it was last minute. They had it on the school grounds. The sprinklers came on while the vendors were out there. They had one performer. It was like somebody just threw that at the last minute. Man, this is what it's come to. It seems like EPA, the castle. It wasn't, li it wasn't like they put too much focus on the activities for the African-American community. Seems like they're just more leaning toward the Latino community because that's the bigger population, and that's probably where they're getting most of the income from that population. So I guess it all comes down to politics and business. It's just sad that some of the activities that the city used to pride itself on, they really let them go. And it's sad because sometimes that makes people feel foreign too knowing that you can't even stay within your own city and have some type of festival. You see in Aaron's comments, really, the, that explicit flipping of the assimilation equation where he talks about feeling foreign too. And in some ways, Aaron's biography represents the kind of complicated nature of the group dynamics. His own, he is married into a Mexican uh, immigrant family, has children 
who are of mixed origin, but still has this larger connection to a black community in East Palo Alto that he's feel like, he feels like is being diminished. Now, in the story that I've told so far is one in which, in some ways, the ethno-racial order has been kind of flipped around, particularly in relation to whiteness. And so if individuals that we interviewed experience whiteness and in some ways blackness locally, they make sense of it in a lar with a larger frame of reference. And that larger frame of reference shows up when they talk about assigning um, blame and notions of privilege, how they make sense of this kind of new ethno-racial order. Among, and I'll talk here about uh, uh, Cupertino and East Palo Alto. In Cupertino, we never heard anyone say, and Adam, you can correct me if I'm wrong, we never heard anyone say that the Asian immigrant population and the second generation population uh, made them reconsider their approach to school, made them feel like, remind them that they need to work harder, that they need to be more like the immigrant population uh, in their commitment to academic pursuits. In fact, what they said is that the Asian origin immigrant population is weird, odd, strange in their commitment to, um, to academic achievement. Now, their, uh, their kind of... Um, uh, verbal retort to that approach did little to change their sense that they were uh, operating in many ways as a minority in this community, but it nonetheless is an important way in which they made sense of this. In the interest of time, I'm going to kind of skip down to the bottom, but this is, uh, this is a woman named Lori Brewer who's a banker in Cupertino who uh, their closest family friends are uh, an, a couple from India they have two children, and her, she, Lori and her husband, who's an Israeli immigrant, have two children, and they play together a lot, so they know this family really well. Lori's criticizing the degree to which the father in particular uh, makes them do homework even on vacation and finishes the quote by saying, it's really weird. And so they're drawing on larger notions of the white norm and how they make sense of these things, even if, again, they're kind of swimming upstream to try to change their everyday lives in reference to these things. One way to put it is they're internalizing notions of whiteness that are made uh, in a larger context. And African-American respondents that we interviewed likewise internalize larger notions of blackness that are formed in a larger context. In contrast to the whites who always pointed the finger outward to try to make sense of this kind of uh, flip notion of whiteness. The black people we interviewed almost always pointed the finger inward, taking responsibility for what they said was a failed effort at group uplift. So as, um, as Yvonne Winston told, uh, told me, I admire how the Asian community can live together. Grandma and grandpa take care of their grandkids, and the husband and wife go out to work and how they work together to run the household. Everybody has a role, everybody fulfills their role. Hispanic does the same thing, they do the same thing. Whoever's home, they do the cooking and the cleaning. If the baby is too small to go to school, the baby stays home with them, but the, but the expenses are minimum and the dads and the sons will go out and produce money to keep the roof and the heat and the, fl and the food flowing. I wish that the African American could, do, could learn how to do the, and coexist like that with each other and family, but they don't. And actually, I cut off some of this quote, she's even more critical than that. So these findings, I think, in many ways encourage us as sociologists to rethink the effect that immigration has on ethno-racial categories, their meaning, and their status. Now, there's a couple of ways in which uh, social scientists and historians, in fact, have understood that effect. One is that uh, immigrants are absorbed into the kind of existing ethno-racial categories and take on all their privilege and baggage. And so it's a story about how certain immigrants become white or become Latino or become black. Another characterization has it that immigrants come to the United States and serve as a contrastive foil that reifies the existing ethno-racial categories. One might think of the reaction to Chinese and Japanese immigrants at, uh, in the late 19th century and the effort to define citizenship uh, ever more exclusively in terms of whiteness, as, and the presence of Asian immigrants effectively uh, reified the category of whiteness in, in kind of legal code. But I think there's another possibility going on here, and that other possibility shows that uh, immigration destabilizes ethno-racial categories in their meaning and status and how they operate in everyday life. This is not an argument that white privilege as we've known it is gone. It's an argument that there are cracks 
in that, uh, in that larger edifice and cracks that are visible in local places, in small communities like the ones that, uh, that I studied. And so you see it in the visibly upending of whiteness in Cupertino and the invisibly reification of blackness uh, in East Palo Alto, as I've talked about, and something in the middle in, Cooper, in uh, Berryessa. So let's zoom back out to the larger argument of the book, which, uh, which I'm working out right now. So forgive me if the next slide seems a little bit disjointed. One observation that comes as a result of having done these interviews and analyzing the, the, the interview transcripts is that the um, observable changes that immigration is bringing about to American society are not seen just in the immigrants and the children of those immigrants or even the people who descend from the post-65 immigrants, but also in the most generationally established population. Immigrants aren't just changing American society by adding to it, they're actually changing the very people who have been here for a long time, and that is one of the ways in which uh, that change is coming about. And so this relational adjustment, the relational assimilation um, perspective that I'm trying to work out holds that the adjustment strategies made by guests to get along in American society force the host to make adjustments of their own. And there's a back and forth at the micro level that over time incrementally changes the very nature of the mainstream. Again, not just by immigrants becoming part of the mainstream as they kind of push their way into it, but by changing the people, how they think, how they perceive, how they make sense of their experience in everyday life. Now, I said a minute ago that I was studying a place that in many ways is very unique. Uh, and, and we know that because we live here. Uh, but it's, very, it's unique because there's a huge immigrant population. In fact, this is, it's playing out in dramatic terms in Silicon Valley. I have some speculation based on this study and based on the existing research about the factors that might shape the degree to which assimilation is truly a relational process. The argument that I'm making in the book is not that it's symmetrical. It's not that every, we're all gonna start eating salsa and speaking Spanish and, and celebrating Chinese New Year alongside Christmas or something like that. Um, the argument is that there are elements of, uh, of um, the immigrant way of doing things that force change among the people who have been established here, but that's likely, um, the degree to which that happens is likely structured by the relative power of the respective populations, the socioeconomic status, the size of the population. So you see in Cupertino there's tremendous influence that uh, and if I had time to tell you about every other finding of the book, you'd see there's tremendous influence that the Asian immigrant population has, partly because they're, they're just large in numbers, but also because they're of a relatively high uh, class status. You can think of lots of situations where an immigrant population is large in numbers, but has a low class status, and their influence does not register nearly in the way that it would if they had a class status. High class status, one might think of a lot of places in the Central Valley of California, for example or in even bigger terms, one might think of uh, apartheid South Africa. Um, and so, yeah, I have here on this, this kind of last point that, uh, so what we might see over the long term, uh, even though we're not, you know, this doesn't give me a crystal ball, but that's not gonna stop me from making predictions, is that the, there might be potentially uneven influence in the way that the mainstream changes as a result of immigration and the imprint that different immigrant groups make on it. So among Latinos, because of the size, but the relative, uh, status of the population, you might see the cultural influence outpace uh, their status, and, and in the case of Asian subgroups, for example, you might see their status outpace their culture. Thank you.